What are we talking about for the next half hour? And it's a lot of information. So I was, I was asked to talk about occupational health issues in agriculture in half an hour, which is absolutely massive. So one of the reasons I got 46 slides, and I might at some point be scrolling through a bunch of these things, I'm going to focus on sort of uh, a couple things. First off, I'm just going to talk about our experience. So we've got a little bit of a window into this world. And granted, it's sort of a jaded or, or certain perspective. So we've been seeing migrant farm workers for a number of years. So I'll just talk a little bit about what we've seen. And that's just one aspect of what you might expect in agriculture and in occupational health issues. I'll also talk about a couple other data sources, CHC data source as well as a merge data source. So these are some different perspectives and, and hopefully you'll just get a sense of what's being seen in Ontario and health issues in these workers. And then beyond that, if we have time, and I just put it at the end because it might be a little less interest, going into the literature and those are the data sources that would, uh, are more global for. It's a lot of American stuff, but there's, there's global data. And that's what would you theoretically expect, or what do other jurisdictions report as far as health issues amongst agriculture and migrant farm workers? Um, I, I tried to sort of titrate it down a little bit to migrant farm workers, but it, it's all of agriculture as well. And of course, the difficulty in doing this is it's such a heterogeneous industry. So, you know, I'm talking, if I'm talking about health issues of steel workers, it's, it's pretty defined. Well, agriculture is so many different things and so many different factors. So it's incredibly broad. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that bit of an intro. I'm not sure if you heard much about our, our clinic. So we, we work at uh, the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. It's a network of clinics across the province. And a number of years ago, in 2006, we decided to isolate or, or direct some resources to examining this population of migrant farm workers. And we started out really small. We just um, did a couple of clinics in the Niagara region, and just uh, and we had advocates essentially bring workers to us and just start to explore what sort of health issues they had. And then it grew sort of year by year, and we expanded to the different to various locations. So I just listened there, but we sort of do satellites at, at various uh, various clinics. This is what they look like. So um, I think we heard this morning they they have very limited time, so they typically come into town on Friday. So we set up try to set up shop and hang a shingle somewhere in the community on a Friday night when the workers are all coming. Uh, it might be a Sunday. We've done soccer events, so we're rather transient as far as doing this. And you try to be in their face, that is high traffic areas, because they only have a, a limited amount of time in their town shopping for three hours, four hours. They want to socialize, they have to shop. And where our health issues testing, are usually rather low on the list as far as what they want to deal with. So you have to make it easy for them to get in there. Um, what sort of numbers do we see? 15 to 20 maybe in an evening in about a three hour period. And it's sort of, you try and minimize the barriers, and I'm not going to talk about the barriers at all, although that's really interesting. I'm su I assume there will be other talks involved in that. But uh, no health card, obviously, translators. We try and make it accessible and friendly and put it in um, uh, easy sort of places. I should mention as well, Will is here, Ben Hennigan, who's just taking a bite, but he's a doctor as well at the clinic. He's got a, a lot of experience. If I say something, if you want to jump in, Will, just jump in. And if anyone has any comments at any point, uh, jump in. So this is me just seeing the people. You can see it's rather sparse, spartan accommodations. We sort of do clinics wherever we can do clinics. And this was in the uh, Minor Farm Workers Center in Simcoe. And we just sort of literally had a back closet that we could operate at. Uh, operate. Uh, not, not literally. So, yeah. This is a it, it's hard to share all the experiences, and to be honest, the data collection is very difficult for these workers. This sort of summarizes what we've seen over the years, and it's uh, a lot of data here. And I'll just sort of walk through some of the generalities and make some comments on it. So a couple general comments. We're seeing about 100 to 200 workers a year. So this is since 2007, when, when, uh, once we started doing the actual clinics, we've seen over 1,000 workers. So it gives us some sort of assessment. Remember these clinics are occupational health clinics, so it's rather specialized. What we try and advertise is for migrant farm workers to come in if they have occupational health issues. So it's got a little bit of a different perspective. We're not advertising for sexual health issues specifically or non-occupational things. But if you sort of squint your eyes at this, you'll see that we get a lot of non-occupational stuff anyways. And it's sort of speaks to the fact that these workers will go and see 
a doctor for whatever, for, uh, whenever they can. So, uh, as it turns out, it's about, I would say, a third to a half of the stuff we see is non-occupational, despite the fact that we're, we're trying not to see that sort of stuff. Okay, so to walk through some of the data, as you might expect, so what do you see in these workers? What sort of health effects? The biggest one is MSK. And the MSK sort of things tend to be uh, injuries or uh, repetitive strain injuries. We don't see much of the acute injuries, the lacerations, the traumas, because they won't wait and see us on a Friday night. Those things are probably going to emerge, and I'll show you those stats in a few minutes. So we don't see that, but it's a lot of MSK. And MSK, what are the common areas? Typically back, that's number one. Shoulders would be number two. And then you get all the other things, uh, knees, ankles, wrists, sort of uh, uh, more peripheral type of issues. And they tend to be repetitive <coughs> strain, so it's from the work. And clearly the work factors are, are far and away outweigh any sort of other factor. In fact, these guys don't do much besides work. Uh, there's a little bit of recreation, but almost nothing. Um, and just as a general comment uh, about these clinics, they're very interesting. I'll tell you medically, they're, they're not that interesting. I don't know what you think, Will, but you know, it's not that challenging treating these things. And the stuff is very run-of-the-mill and very basic primary care. We don't, despite asking for occupational stuff, we don't get a lot of exotic stuff coming into the clinic like interstitial lung disease or cancer or something rare. It tends to be very primary care. And that indicates that, uh, for one thing, they don't have primary care access otherwise. So they don't have much else, no, uh, not too many other places to go. Um, and, also, and it also questions the fact, well, are there other or more serious diseases out there for these people relatively healthy? Can anyone speculate actually why we don't get serious diseases or what the issues might be that we don't see cancers, we don't see much dermatitis? Yeah. I was just wondering if um, maybe there's some amount of screening before uh, they arrive in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. Elderly? I'm sure that's one of the biggest factors. So these people can't come unless they're healthy. So every year they all get reset. So uh, when they leave in December, if they're ill, uh, if they're substantially ill, if they do have a cancer, a neurological disease, or asthma as a result of the work, they're probably not coming back the next year because they have to go through a medical screening. And that would, uh, the screening depends on the home country and, and it's quite comprehensive actually. Often blood work, uh, chest x-ray, medical examination. So it's a huge one. It's what's called a healthy worker effect. So we don't see a lot of serious disease. Is it not out there? No, it probably is out there, except you're getting a very biased sample of who these workers are. So that's a big one. The other one, of course, is that these people have to be healthy to work. So they'll select themselves a little bit. You don't go into agriculture and you don't put up your hand to volunteer to go to a foreign country if you're not feeling very healthy. And we see that in general workplaces as well beyond agriculture, that is, if you get sick in the workplace, you'll start selecting yourself out of that. So it's a similar sort of bias along the same way. The other reason I think that, another reason I think we don't see the serious stuff is that um, we are just the Friday night clinic. So I think Emerge will see that a little bit. I'll show that in a second. Okay, so sorry, back to the stats a bit. So MSK is the big one. And I think John uh, uh, mentioned that, and, and that's where a lot of the focus is for health and safety issues and uh, uh, stats provincially. So that's why I'm going to focus more on the other stuff. And it's interesting to look at the proportion because there is actually a lot of disease there that pro over half of the stuff isn't the falls and sprains and injuries. It's actually diseases. So dermal, that's skin condition. So we see a lot of dermatitis and that's just some sort of skin inflammation. Usually due to irritants. It's not so much the allergens or the exotic stuff. It's just working in damp environments or working with your hands a lot. There's some people that get skin inflammation and it's really difficult to treat. So we see a lot of dermatitis. Um, Sorry. Next one is eye, 12% uh, of the stuff approximately. So um, this is typically conjunctivitis, uh, pterygium, and I'll, I'll go over it a little bit if I have time. But uh, the eye issues tend to be relatively minor, but similar to the dermatitis, these sort of festering, irritant-related things, so often due to ultraviolet uh, exposure that they're working outside all the time, due to dust, uh, wind, general inflammation or irritant type of uh, exposures. 
The next one's kind of interesting, and you'll see in the next few slides, it's a rather persistent issue about amongst migrant farm workers in Ontario, and it's gastrointestinal complaints. So here we are in occupational health clinic. We're saying, just come to us if you've got an occupational health issues. We get a lot of guys coming in saying, I've got abdominal pain. Uh, and do you find that well? You, yeah, and, and it's very non-specific. So I also work urgent care emerge. I get a lot of abdominal pain, and, and you know, you usually think, well, is it appendicitis or something surgical or not? And these guys are all non-surgical, so it never tends to be anything. But there tends to be, and I don't know what you think, but there's a bit of a cultural focus or certainly some predisposition of abdominal pain in migrant farm workers here that we see it all the time and they call it different things gastritis is often what they say when they come in that they feel they have gastritis and i think it's just sort of this maybe irritable bowel maybe a gastritis like a, um, a peptic ulcer disease sort of condition but it's something that we consistently see and something i've actually never tagged down the problem with our clinics is that it's hard to do follow-up so a more standard patient, you might see someone with abdominal pain, then order blood work, then order ultrasound, and follow up with that person. Whereas for us, it has to be a little more um, acute. You manage that person, we probably won't see them again. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to order tests because you've got to arrange transportation and translation that it's almost impossible to do. So it just, it makes it hard to know what that is. But just to highlight the fact, GI issues is, is quite prevalent in this population. Next one is respiratory, and that might be anticipated as well. It's again going back to the theme that these guys are around a lot of irritants. So the respiratory stuff that I've seen tends to be either infectious disease like cough, bronchitis. Working in close quarters might contribute to that. Uh, just the general nature of health, it, it's always one of the top ones as far as any sort of health system is, is respiratory complaints, and infectious wise. Don't see much asthma, and, and it's a little disappointing. I, I, well, it's not disappointing, but <laughs> <laughs> I sort of have a professional, yeah, interest in asthma and lung disease. And we don't see that much asthma or interstitial lung disease. And again, again, I think they select themselves out. But um, it tends to be more just irritant uh, or infectious type of things. Uh, other category, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, Genital urinary is another one, an important one to point out. Do you know what that would be? What do you think those complaints are? STDs, yeah, STDs. Yeah. STDs. So we get uh, a lot of workers in our home culture making that come in and complaints. And it's funny because culturally they don't, they don't come in saying the same thing, so you have to be a little attuned to it. That a Jamaican worker will come in and they'll say, um, uh, uh, sort of problems, they, they walk around it, and some of them are actually as well having issues with erectile dysfunction. But the language isn't clear, and they speak different terms than someone in North America might speak, because they don't see the commercials, and they don't know what to say. And I think sometimes there's cultural taboos with how they say it. We're still learning how you know, culturally we mix with what they're trying to do, and it's the art of medicine. And I said before, this stuff isn't exactly challenging medically, but socially it's really interesting. That's what makes the job great, isn't it? To see these workers, and, and they're different workers than what we see in North America, so it's fun to see them sort of learn how to deal with different people. So that's mainly uh, STDs. Cardiovascular, that's alluding to chest pains. And we see just this smattering of mental health issues. And I think this mental health talk a little later on today, it'd be really good to go to that. So there are mental health issues. We don't see a lot of them. Um, I think maybe we don't do the best job of looking for it. I think it's out there. There's a term called nervios that a number of them have brought up, and this is sort of a, um, a Latino construct of, I think, anxiety. It ties in not only to anxiety, though, which they don't really talk about, and they don't talk about depression, but they'll say nervios. It ties into anxiety, but it also talks in, ties into more um, uh, physiologic things like abdominal pain. So a number of these abdominal pains are coming in. They say my abdomen hurts, and I think it's nervios. And, and, and you try to try to figure out what exactly that is. And again, we're sort of on part of the learning curve to understand that. Mental health, of course, as well as due to displacement of these workers. So they're in new environments, stressful sometimes. Um, imagine what it's like living with 20 coworkers or 100 coworkers on a farm without family. So there's all those sort of issues. 
Um, I think there can be a whole science behind exploring that, and there's probably a lot better case detection than what we do to look for these sort of things, but culturally there's uh, probably a lot of barriers as well. So you might want to go see that mental health book. I think that would be very interesting. Um, so that was our experience, just some broad brush strokes of what it looked like. Again, it was from an occupational health perspective. Now, what's happened over the last few years is the um, CHC in Simcoe, or I should say Brantford, has set up a clinic in Simcoe to essentially take over some of the work that we used to do. So for the last two summers, there's been a CHC there every Friday night running a clinic for these workers. So they have two years experience in seeing these people. Now their experience is a little different because they'll see anything. And they have a little bit more longitudinal care, so they'll see workers in follow-up to some extent, and they're there every Sunday, whereas we were only there perhaps every two to four weeks. Um, so this is just a brief slide of some of the he uh, uh, top uh, things that they see. As you can expect, MSK is the big one. Uh, dermal or dermatitis type of issues is number two. And then they get into chronic diseases, and, and um, having worked now, we sort of align ourselves with them, so I'll work some of these things. And you see a lot of chronic care type of issues, so blood pressure checks, follow-up on diabetes, follow-up on chronic care conditions. And it sort of speaks to the fact that they don't have access to healthcare, otherwise there's a real need to have a clinic like this for a number of these workers, because there are a number of, chronic, number of these, uh, sorry, a number of workers with chronic diseases that need longitude and follow-up. And this, uh, these clinics really play a role in it. Uh, STI concerns, ENT concerns. Um, I've only worked a few of these. Well, do you have any comments just on the CHC clinic? You've done a few of them, haven't you? Yes, I have. I, that, those numbers look about right. So yeah. For the chronic disease, you'll see a lot of diabetes. Yeah. Renewals for that kind of stuff, which I find those sometimes a bit tricky because there's no follow up that they're able to do. Uh, although there's a little bit of variety at the CHC. Yeah, and the follow-up hasn't been, I know it's really challenging, you know, to see a diabetic, they're not really for the first time, but I, I've had a couple that come, come and they say, yeah, I'm diabetic, but I didn't come with my medications, and you're thinking, why didn't you come with your medications? So you're prescribing and you're trying to translate what they had in, in Mexico, for instance, and get them started on something, but it's very intimidating to start a patient you've never seen before, and you're not sure of the follow-up on something, Fortunately, there's a pharmacy down, uh, we hold it in the um, uh, super center in Simcoe, so there's a pharmacy in the building actually, and the pharmacist has some diabetic education experience, so you can send them down and they'll give them a glucometer, some sticks, so it's sort of growing. It's one of these things where the seeds are being planted, and hopefully this would, this would evolve into something good. Is there a talk on the Simcoe? CHC experience? Yeah, the, like, the, the next plenary is, it highlights old pounds work and Right. Work and, uh, yeah, so that would be system. good. Just to hear their system, it's, it, it seems to be a great solution. Anyways, that's an aside about beyond the uh, initial health issues. Um, so those are, those are those experiences. The other one, and this is perhaps the best data sources emerge. So in Simcoe, uh, really the only health access a lot of these workers had for years was to go to the Simcoe Hospital. And so if you had an issue, you went to eMERGE, because family docs wouldn't take people, and there was no walk-in clinic or anything. So we got the data from the Simcoe Hospital. I, sorry, I cut this really down. This, is, this represents five years of data. I think it was like 2005 to 2010, approximately. This is, they had the foresight to flag all migrant farm worker visits in the Simcoe Hospital. So these are all the workers that came there over that five-year period. And of course, it's very transient, so there's none in the winter, and they're all peaking. June, July, and August. Um, and then it represents the issues that they were seeing and emerge for issues. Uh, so let's just walk through those. So number one is injury. So they do see the falls, the fractures, the lacerations, the acute injuries or trauma, and that's almost a third of what they're seeing. The next one, interestingly, is GI. And so I was able to go through all of these charts or review a number of these charts, and it's the same thing, that these patients present with abdominal pain. And it tends to be non-specific. There were a couple surgical, I think there might have been one appendix or something, but most of them are non-specific gastrointestinal complaints. Next one is MSK. That's alluding to more repetitive strain type of injuries, so that's number three in the list as might be anticipated. And then it's the same sort of culprit. So you're seeing the same things over and over again, uh, the rest issues. 
skin, urinary, and that's uh, uh, sexual health issues. They saw that a lot on eMERGE, and the eMERGE physicians particularly define that as one of the more common things that they see, although the numbers don't completely bear that out. Um, <coughs> Just a couple, this is sort of more of a descriptive uh, analysis in what the eMERGE data showed. So they actually did see two cancers. Cancer of the brain and connective tissue is what, what's very rare. Both of those are rare. Um, the question is, is that work-related? Probably not, I, I don't know. It's a very difficult thing to answer because you don't know where they worked and you don't know, the, I don't know the exact diagnosis of those, but uh, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, respiratory conditions were almost all infections. Only one case of asthma, GI, non-specific abdominal pain I mentioned, uh, and you read the rest. So three admissions for work-related injuries, I think they were fractures. Uh, and we often get the question about pesticides, and I'm running out of time, but I, the, the theoretical stuff was going to speak a lot to pesticides. If you look in the literature and you Google or ask PubMed, what are the health issues in agriculture, there's a lot of focus on pesticides. Um, the eMERGE stuff doesn't show it so much. And as well, my personal experience is, I don't see a lot of pesticide issues. I think for, for a couple of reasons, it's somewhat crop specific. So these people, they don't use that much in the way of pesticides depending on the crops. Uh, and if they do, it's only certain workers. And those certain workers, I think, are doing fairly well as well as protection. Secondly, I'm not sure we identify it all that well. I truly try to do my best because I have an interest in pesticides. It tends to be urgent effects of pesticides, not so much the allergic effects, not so much the cancers or neurological effects. And I don't see a lot of poisoning, so I'm not sure that, the, that there is the egregious pesticide exposures in our area that uh, you perhaps might think. And that's just anecdotal based on sort of my impression of, of seeing the workers in some of this data as well. Nevertheless, it's certainly something important to identify as a health issue, because if I had the time, I could talk to all the uh, pesticide issues that are out there. Um, that's, I kind of skip over that. I just, let me just go through these slides just for a sec. And it speaks to the point. So up to this point, you know, it, there are a lot of occupational diseases out there. And, and John sort of mentioned some of the stats as far as injuries. The stats as far as the diseases, like the dermatitis, respiratory disease, all the other conditions that are non-injury are really lacking. So if you ask WSIB, well, was there any asthma among the smarter farmers? They would say, no, it doesn't occur. Well, I'm not sure it doesn't occur. I'm quite sure it's not reported. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of look at that a little bit from the eMERGE data. So when we looked at the data from the uh, eMERGE and Simcoe, we found that of all of the cases, 29% were identified as being work-related. And those would be obvious, like the falls and the injuries and those sort of things. But if you start doing a chart audit, that is looking at all these cases specifically, you see that it, they're actually being missed and there's a number of occupational diseases that uh, aren't being identified. So when I did a chart audit, um, clearly there were another 55 that were obviously work-related that weren't being run under WSIB, so we're missing some of those. And if, oh, sorry, and if you look again, And if you look even finer at the data, it's about half and half. So bottom line is, if you look at the WSIB data, it's lacking. And we know that from this eMERGE source, they're missing a lot of occupational diseases. And that's probably more the disease. I think doctors are, are pretty astute to know if someone falls on a farm, breaks their ankle. That's work related. So I don't think missing those. It's all the other, the dermatitis, the respiratory disease. And we actually did some qualitative data to talk to the eMERGE docs and say, so why do you think some of this is being missed? And it is these sort of things. It's, it's very clear when it's uh, cause and effect type of thing of the injuries. The other diseases aren't being identified. So highlighting the fact, don't rely on WSIB and the work-relatedness of this, which is something we care very much about at OCAL, is often being misidentified or missed in, in the health issues of these people. Um, I think I'll wrap up there, just to give a few minutes of questions and keep things on time. I got to none of the theoretical stuff, which is too bad, because there's some really interesting things. Um, 
but at least you'll have a sense of what Ontario looks like. And just to summarize there, uh, you know, MSK certainly is an issue, but hopefully to highlight the fact that the diseases are an issue as well. Some of the heavy hitters are the dermatitis, respiratory disease, and gastrointestinal, and it's being under-recognized. Okay, so uh, we have a couple, uh, one minute for questions. Well, and then there's a break, so there's time. Anybody are there any questions? I comments? I just have a comment. Yeah. Um, this, and this is based off of like, um, in point, the leaning, the farm workers in like, in the in area. Yeah, um, so a lot of greenhouses. Right. Yeah. Um, I think as far as like the mental health part, um, I think a lot of it has, why it's such a low number is that I find that a lot of them don't talk about it. Yeah. Um, one, they drink their way, um, they like numb it through alcohol and whatnot, really? and this is like, like throughout the day, because yeah. um, we've also gone to like their um, their bunks and stuff like that just to see like what they do and stuff, and a lot of them have complaints. Um, once we built a rapport with them and they have like they trust us kind of thing, mm -hmm. and they start talking more, um, it's like completely evident that they do have mental health issues, but they just don't share it because some of them would be worried about if they you know. Um, might be sent back or whatnot, so right. it's kind of like you know, because you can't, it's not something that you could see like an eye infection or, or you know, what's, what sort of mental health issues? You know, would you, can, um, would you have an idea? There's of the a few that have talked about um, like uh, feeling lonely, depression, some, more depression. Um, some would talk about missing their family and stuff like that, so yeah. homesick. Yeah. Um, Nothing that I mean I can't I I I can't yeah. diagnose them so I don't know yeah. to what extent and how many of the yeah. of the symptoms that they have to be like, qualified as like you could get they're not 100 yeah. normal from the way they came and then a year or two later their yeah. attitudes and everything changed they're miserable yeah. you know and this is not all some of them come with a because some people come with a positive attitude some don't yeah. so I'm sure that has an effect to it too yeah. I just think. Um, because it's something that is not visible, um, it's harder to assess yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and as far as diagnosis, it's very difficult because in diagnosis, you know, it's not, if you have depression, well, what is depression? It's some right. funny North American construct from the DSM. Well, does right. that apply to a Caribbean population or a Mexican population exactly. or a Thai population? Exactly. Who knows? It probably doesn't because they don't use the same terms. So how do we ever diagnose those things? And to be honest, part of the elephant too is how do you treat them? So, you know, unfortunately in medicine, sometimes you don't want to ask a question because you don't know what to do with it anyway. So what am I going to do? I identify someone as being depressed. Well, I'm not sure, you know, it, it's often stressors that I can't manage anyway. So it's it, a bit of the unfortunate reality is you sometimes don't want to hear the answer either, but it's a huge area, I'm sure. Yeah, thanks for that comment. Just going to hear a lot of anxiety. Yeah. A lot of anxiety. For what reasons? Um, anywhere from bullying um, really? to isolation. Yeah. Yeah. So that could be a workplace call. Oh, that's. <laughs> yeah. That a nightmare well, itself. Yeah. yeah, it's a very gray area. Is that <laughs> compensation claim? Yeah, bullying could be, depending on the circumstance. And uh, it depends, to be honest, how you articulate that on a form eight as far as what exactly happened. You know, deny or, or accept that. Yeah, we're, uh, we've been working with the Ministry of Labor on a, uh, and it's actually being run by a researcher outside so the inspector part of the Ministry of Labor, doing a, a risk assessment of uh, the uh, greenhouse industry. And we've had a series of workshops with and, and they've separated uh, representative workers from representative employers, and uh, and the information uh, it, it hasn't been released yet. But it was, it's been interesting. One, they they were asked to identify the most prevalent risks in, that they felt they were being exposed to in these workplaces, mm -hmm. and uh, stress and alcohol, drug abuse really? were two of the ten risk factors that were self-identified by both the employers and the workers, and they were higher ranked by the workers than the employer did. Um, and, 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 and so instead of calling it mental health, they just 
it was very nonspecific. I, I stressed I, all these different things that they're having to deal with in their life, both the the, the isolation, the uh, the the heavy heavy work. Like I mean, you're, you're, like no recreation, downtime. Like you talk about work-life balance. There's no work-life balance here at all. It's, and so what what's taking the toll? And it struck me when you were. Um, like what? What are the physical symptoms of stress? And so we automatically go to: is it a psychological, mental health issue, like a, a, a prescribed depression or anxiety or something? Or what? What is this? This, this general: my body's being bombarded um, stress-wise, and so on. What's, what? What is that taking in my body over time? And, uh, uh, particularly when you're seeing high gastrointestinal yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, I'm sure that's a component of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you say that you identify 6% of STI concerns. I would like to know what's, what's next after you identify the disease. And then you give some, well, the treatment, but like a conscious because this what's the longer term this, sort of plan in, in, in addressing that no because yeah because they can i mean infect other people so it's like a protocol or like a process or falling out or they're like a song someone like talk to them with contract contact tracing you mean or, or uh -huh. follow up directly with those patients yeah that's a good question um we don't get involved in that so much it's uh again we try not to do non-occupational uh, non things um, public health is pretty aware of sexual health issues amongst these workers and, and most of the health fairs will have public health there and most of their thrust is actually sexual health issues. The normal conduit of contact tracing is either the individual or through public health. How much does a merge department, for instance, engage someone to do contact tracing? It's a very good question. I don't know. I'm sure it's incredibly challenging. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Good I just uh, worked in um, yeah, I, I worked in CD and it was and we received the positive lab results for any of the reported diseases. So that contact tracing is then done within the health unit if it's in that area. So with the respective health unit would do the follow up for contact tracing and education. And I I've seen some of these cases at the CHC clinic and if it's uh, you know, it's a compelling case to treat empirically, so you just, they actually have treatment for media gonorrhea there, so I just gave it to the worker right then, and then he sent off a urine, which then it was positive, public health to get, and I assume try to contact the worker. But we only follow up positive results. Yeah. Though they may have already been treated, so that's why it's so important to get them tested prior to treatment. Okay, uh, a uh, yeah, um, slightly different topic. You talk about the gastrointestinal um, component. Um, I work in public health, but we do the housing inspections okay. instead. So, do you see anything that sort of triggers to your mind that it might be uh, communicable in terms of uh, food poisoning or water quality? I, I've seen a few of those cases, and not a lot. Okay. And it's too bad I didn't go with the literature because that's actually what is implicated a lot of the time in the in the states. So I think, again, I get sort of a funny jaded view. I don't think I get the sick, sick people that I, I, I would guess that the true infectious disease, and, and I think it's a very good point, I think that's probably a source of a lot if you're to believe the literature. I think those are probably going to emerge to get treated, and I'm probably seeing the sort of second tier of the abdominal pains. But yeah, I, that, that is a, a very important source. Uh, parasites are just general infectious disease that, that's reported from close living quarters and uh, hygiene issues and, and just general, you know, you get large groups of people living together. You know, see that. Yeah. 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 Yeah